thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll now have our second Tishi, uh, second Tishok, I should say, John Bruton. Concorda, uh, uh, friends, um, former senators, two former senators here, uh, Pat and Jim. Um, first of all, I'd like to compliment uh, the Count Corla on what he said uh, about the, the vitality of the TDs that were elected to the first style uh, on this occasion. Uh, and his acknowledgement that all of them, those who were elected and those indeed who contested the election without being successful, uh, were all of them uh, having the best interests of Ireland at heart. I'd also like to agree quite strongly with um, Bertie Hearn about the importance of understanding history, uh, not just the, of one's own country, but of neighbouring countries. And I think the nearest neighbour is the history one needs to understand best after one's own, and that's something, they, something that doesn't seem to be, as he pointed out, uh, the case uh, in the United Kingdom. I wouldn't be too hard on revisionist historians. I, I think it's very important indeed to recognize that all new ideas in, about history are all revisionist. And indeed, the revisionists will be revised, and the revising of the revisionists will also in its turn be revised again. And that's what makes history endlessly interesting and keeps historians employed. Uh, uh, no, uh, so. Uh, I'm all for that anyway. Um, uh, the, as, and I, I'm going to be saying this quite a bit through my speech, as Bertie Hearn has already said, uh, because he has said a lot of the things I'm going to say, and I didn't have sight of what he was going to say before I prepared my remarks, nor did he of mine. The background to this election was the Great War, the end of the Great War. The UK Prime Minister had called the election very quickly after the end of the hostilities, within a month, because um, he felt that in the island of Britain he would benefit, and his party or his coalition would benefit, from the good feelings about the war having ended victoriously, as was the case for uh, the UK and its allies. And that he, it was sort of a khaki election. People voting in uniform, he hoped, would return him to office, as they did. But the war was a particular factor in Ireland because of the conscription crisis of early 1918. Conscription had applied on, on the island of Britain, but not on the island of Ireland, from 1916 onwards. Then the big German offensive of 1918 which nearly broke through, created a panic in the UK government. Manpower was running short, and the Americans were very slow in arriving at the front. So perhaps unsurprisingly, Lloyd George was under political pressure in Scotland, in Wales and England, where conscription had applied for the past two years, to extend the same conscription to Ireland. And in March 1918, he announced his intention to do so. This caused convulsion in Ireland. Until his announcement, the Irish party had been holding its own politically. Sinn Féin had lost by-elections to the Irish party in South Armagh, East Tyrone and Waterford City early in 1918. Lloyd George's announcement, which he never followed through, changed all that. His conscription threat then drove Irish Party voters into the arms of Sinn Féin in the second half of 1918. If the election had been held over, which it could have been, until the spring of 1919, when all the servicemen might have returned and things had cooled down about conscription, just as they had cooled down about the 1916 executions uh, after, after, uh, after a year or so, the result in the Irish election of December 1918 might not have been as dramatic as it was. At the time of the 1918 election here in Ireland, 
a peace conference was soon to be convened by the victor victorious allies in Versailles. As far as Ireland was concerned, in anticipation of the peace conference, great expectations had been raised uh, by speeches by President Wood Woodrow Wilson, his 14 points, containing strong declarations in, in favor of what he called the principle of national self-determination. Indeed, the concept of national self-determination required a, required a quasi-religious status in many quarters. But the territory of the nation was not so easily defined in some cases. As President Wilson was to discover, when he got down to work in Versailles, the concept of national self-determination was difficult to apply when people with fundamentally different identities and national allegiances live together in the same geographic area, as is and was the case in Northeast Ulster and in many other parts of Europe. In the Balkans, in L Romania, Slovakia, many of those countries have substantial national minorities. So self-determination entirely depends on the territory you define that you're going to exercise it within. Uh, and the genius of the Downing Street Declaration of Albert Reynolds, of the framework document, which I was involved with, and of the Downing Street de Declaration, in which all of those culminated, is that it got over that problem by devising a means where people inhabiting the same territory with differing national aspirations had a means of living together peacefully, where both aspirations were recognized. That has not, unfortunately, been working as well as it ought, and it has not been imitated as it might have been in other parts of the world, because it is a fundamentally very good idea. As has been pointed out in the 1918 election, in the contested constituencies, Sinn Féin got 46.9% of the votes, Unionists got 28.5%, and the Irish Parliamentary Party got 21.7%. For this, Sinn Féin won 73 seats. Unionists, including one in Dublin, uh, won, won 26, and the Irish Party only won six, a poor showing for 21% of the vote. However, these percentages do understate Sinn Féin's support because of the 25 uncontested seats that were won by Sinn Féin. If these had been contested, and would, would assume that Sinn Féin would have won them all by a significant margin, the Sinn Féin voters that would have been votes that would have been cast in those constituencies would thus probably have pushed the Sinn Féin percentage uh, above the 47% has got to well over uh, 50%. Um, and indeed, some of the uncontested, we, we, turning to the reasons some of these seats were uncontested, I will make reference to intimidation. There was evidence of that. But it is also fair, fair to say that in Munster, where a lot of the uncontested seats were, the Irish party, the United Irish League, was not organisationally strong. In Munster, William O'Brien's All for Ireland League and Tim Healy's supporters, the so-called Bantry Band, they were strong and they transferred their support to Sinn Féin and didn't continue with the constitutional path. Uh, and that is part of the explanation as to why 25 seats were left uncontested by the party that had represented those seats uh, for 40 years. On the other hand, there are credible allegations that intimidation played a part in ensuring that Sinn Féin would not face a contest in some of those seats. Irish party meetings were broken up physically in Cair, County Tipperary, in Rat Mines here in Dublin, in Bohor in County Louth, Jonesborough in County Armagh, Moche in County Westmeath, Clonus in County Monaghan, and Castle Blaney. Uh, candidates who had agreed to stand for the Irish party backed down from doing so in face of some of this activity. The parish priest of Kilchema, 
Dr. O'Hara told John Dillon, who was contesting the seat in East Mayo with Mr. Dowlera, the parish priest said, young roughs are going around the roads at night saying they'll burn down any house that will vote for Dillon. And even more persuasively, threatening to destroy cattle. On, on polling day, peace patrols stood outside the post polling stations, Sinn Féin peace patrols, and it is claimed that they discouraged thousands of Irish party voters from passing through the peace patrol to go to vote. And I owe some of this information to research done by the late Princess Macariasa, published in the Irish Times many years ago, I think 1968. I myself knew a man, a 1916 veteran, who was reputed to have voted 40 times for Sinn Féin <laughs> uh, in the names of different people. And one of the, the phrases went around was, who are you now, Peter? <laughs> now, so, which suggests a degree of collusion between Peter and the presiding officer. However, I don't think this changed the results of the election. Let me say this. I don't think it changed the results of the election, but it altered, would have altered perhaps the proportional support to some degree. Indeed, the Irish party came under a lot of pressure not to contest the election at all from former supporters like the Bishop of Raffoe, Dr O'Donnell. To his eternal credit, the Irish party leader, John Dillon, told the bishop that one should not abandon principles for popularity or unpopularity. Good principles for all weathers, I think. As Bertie has said, the system of election, the straight vote in single member constituencies, meant that Sinn Féin won more seats and the Irish party proportionately fewer seats than would have been the case under proportional representation. Under PR, I guess Sinn Féin might have won about 60 seats, a majority. Unionists, including Labour unionists, about 26, which is what they got. And the Irish Party, perhaps 19 or 20. But under PR, Sinn Féin would still have won a landslide. But the Irish Party would not have suffered a virtual wipeout. Uh, it's also important to, important to point out that among the 26 seats won by unionists, three were won by labour unionists, who are not affiliated to the Ulster Unionist Council, but running as labour candidates who supported the union. And that they won in Belfast seats shows that in some respects, the sectarian divide in urban Ulster is deeper now than it was back in 1918. It's also worth mentioning that Southern Unionists, as Bertie has said, contested the 1918 election uh, 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 on that platform, winning seats in Trinity and Ratmines. Uh, and that bridge, the Southern Unionist bridge between the two traditions, which it was attempted to use to resolve the problem, both in the post-1916 attempt to introduce Home Rule and in the Irish Convention, both of which failed for various reasons, that bridge essentially was destroyed by the 1918 election result. I'd like now to go into the differences in policy between Sinn Féin and the Irish Party and reflect on how far the victors, Sinn Féin, were able to go in fulfilling their promises. Sinn Féin said, I'm quoting from their manifesto, which appears in, as an annex to a book by Michael Hopkinson. Sinn Féin said it would withdraw Irish representatives from Westminster because they said, and I quote, the present Irish members of the English Parliament constitute an obstacle to be removed from the path to the peace conference. As I said earlier, a peace conference was due to be convened by the victors of the Great War in Versailles at that time. Sinn Féin went on to condemn the Irish party for having, quotes, contemplated the mutilation, mutilation of our country by partition, end quotes. This is a reference to John Redmond having agreed in 1916 with Edward Carson to a temporary opt-out from home rule for some unionist majority counties in Ulster as a price for having home rule introduced straight away in the middle of the war in 1916 for the rest of the country with Carson's consent. This, 
ambitious deal did not go through because it was vetoed by the conservative elements in the war cabinet, not by Edward Carson. And Lloyd George, indeed, may not have been saying different things to different people during the negotiation leading up to that. The Sinn Féin manifesto did not address the existence of a unionist minority in Ireland. Instead, it spoke of a unity in national name which has never been challenged. Never been challenged. This seems to ignore the very fact of the challenge posed by Ulster unionism to the 32 county concept of the nation. Ulster unionism was just ignored as it was in the 1916 Declaration of the Republic, as if it did not exist. <coughs> this form of blindness to the existence of the other is reappearing now in the context of Brexit, but on the part of the opposite community. <coughs> the Sinn Féin Manifesto also took a very fundamentalist view of sovereignty, which left no room for compromise. It called for untrammeled national self-determination. And it said it would oppose every candidate who does not accept this principle. To its credit, it followed through on this commitment to impose all candidates whom it did not agree with and contested seats in Belfast. It did very badly. Sinn Féin got only 3% of the vote in Pottinger, 4% in Victoria, 9% in Woodvale, and just 1.89% in Duncairn against Sir Edward Carson. But it, they did fight the election. But what conclusions they drew from that election uh, it, subsequently, uh, and those results that I've just quoted, is something that we ought perhaps to reflect upon. We should also reflect upon that in, national, in the National Falls Division of Belfast, Eamon de Valera, who swept all before him in other constituencies, was defeated by the Irish party's Joe Devlin by 72% to 27%. And Joe Devlin was actually sick during the entire campaign, uh, but was able to get um, 72%. I think he actually may have been following, I don't know if it was Bertie would remember this, the formula offered, offered by another doctoral, Percy doctoral, who um, was re-elected on crutches. Uh, and in fact, Fall, take, having a fall before the election was one of the ways he got onto the front page of the paper uh, and got himself elected. A formula, by the way, I was fortunate enough to apply myself in 1969, but I won't go into that. Um, Sinn Féin, however, going back to their manifesto, and the outworking of that is, I think, something too important, something quite important to consider. Sinn Féin added that the right of the Irish nation to sovereign independence, and I quote, rests on immutable natural law and cannot be made subject to compromise. Those are the words of the manifesto, the mandate. This explicit no compromise mandate, I think, was later to prove troublesome. Some members took it very seriously at the cost of their lives in 1922. And it helps that no compromise element in the manifesto, helps, I think, to explain the civil war. And indeed, the concept of it being derived from immutable natural law had a particular religious provenance, which was not shared by everybody. As to the methods to be used to achieve the goal, Sinn Féin was fairly explicit. They said, and this is what they put before the people, that they would use any and every means available to render impotent the power of England to hold Ireland in subjection by military force or otherwise. This could be construed as seeking and obtaining a mandate for war, and was certainly interpreted as such by the IRA. But the sentence could also perhaps be read as advocating resistance to Br British military force, passively or otherwise, rather than a mandate for initiating violence, as the IRA did at Salahed Beg 
on the day the first oil met in Mount Leitrim. Did the Irish people who voted for Sinn Féin know they were voting for war? That's the question that I can't answer. If they read the manifesto closely, they would have seen that it could be interpreted in that way, but that it also might be interpreted otherwise. And I can't answer the question. Now turn to uh, the Irish Party Manifesto. This was published in the, uh, in the Irish Independent, um, and I assume it was published in the Freeman's Journal as well, but it was published in the Irish Independent on the 11th of October, 1918. Uh, the war was still on. The MV Leinster had been torpedoed the following day. So announcing your manifesto on the same day when there was this other huge story, the, which cost so many Irish lives, the torpedoing by the Germans of the MV Leinster, was perhaps not the best example of news management on the part of the Irish party. But their manifesto was published, as I say, on 11th October 1918. It said, and I quote, that the country must be prepared for a general election about the end of November or the first week in December. This will be the most critical and faithful in its effect for the future of the country since the Union, since 1800. It called for national unity on the basis of the policy that underlay the new departure which had brought the physical force and constitutional traditions together to win land reform and other improvements under the leadership of Parnell. It also said, and this is I think important, that the Irish party would not hold before the Irish people an ideal and an object which it knew to be impossible. Uh, events, were, I think, were to bear out the wisdom of that caution. The Irish party committed itself to be an independent, pledge-bound party in the House of Commons, taking no office under the British government, whose dominating purpose must always be the recovery of Irish national rights and a vigorous agitation on rational lines. It defined its object as the establishment of national self-government for Ireland, including complete executive, legislative and fiscal powers. This went well beyond the Home Rule Act that was then on the statute book, <coughs> and which was due to come into effect automatically once his hostilities in Europe were formally ended, as they were in 1919. Home Rule, passed in 1914, would have come into effect uh, at the point that the Versailles Treaty was concluded. But the difference between the Irish Party position and the existing Home Rule Act is in the reference to fiscal powers, which included inter alia a right to charge customs duties on goods coming into Ireland from Britain and possibly having customs duties charged on goods going from Ireland to Britain. Um, effectively, both the Irish Party and Sinn Féin were agreed on withdrawing Ireland from the Anglo-Irish Customs Union, which had existed since the, you know, early in the 19th century. And this seems, as I say, to be a point on which both were agreed. I will return to that because I think it has some modern salience. The Irish Party criticised Sinn Féin's abstentionist policy, which it said would simply hand over the representation of Ireland in the House of Commons to the followers of Sir Edward Carson. Again, a prescient comment uh, which has modern relevance. Like Sinn Féin, the Irish Party said it would present Ireland's case at the forthcoming peace conference, but added that the chance of getting a good hearing at the peace conference um, would depend on the goodwill of America and the victorious victors in the war, uh, the Allied Dominions. This was just realistic politics. Um, they argued that because Germany was about to lose the war, that sending to Versailles people who had been allied with the losers in the war, with Germany, as recently as 1916, was not the best 
calculated way to get a hearing from the victors of that war. In this respect, I think the Irish party was manifesto was prescient. It is the case, I think, that the Irish party, had they been the ones who went to Versailles, might have got a better hearing. Uh, but what difference would that have made? That we don't know. But certainly the victors of the war, as Bertie acknowledged, a war uh, won at great cost, were not in a particularly conciliatory mood, as we know from the way that Germany was treated, the defeated Germany was treated I I in Versailles. So perhaps having Irish party people there rather than Sinn Féin people might have made that much difference. We don't know. But I think it might have made some. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight, one must conclude that the Sinn Féin policy of abstention had substantial downsides. When the Government of Ireland Act came to be introduced in 1920, replacing the Home Rule Act, which would have come into effect otherwise, it provided for the permanent partition of Ireland. And there were no, very few nationalist MPs present to, attempt, uh, to object to it. Six of them were there, including uh, Joe, Del jo jo Joe Devlin and Major Redmond and others. And they did oppose the Government of Ireland Act, but there were only six of them. So they couldn't do a lot, because most of the Irish constituencies were represented by people who declined to take their seats. But it is important to say that, legally speaking, partition was only introduced in 1920, in the 1920 Act. It was not contained as an explicit provision in the 1914 Act and the absence of Irish representation from Westminster when such a, an important step was being taken, I think is important. So it's important to remember that the majority rule, Storm and Parliament, was, that was created in 1920, was created by that Government of Ireland Act. And thanks to the abstentionist policy, virtually no Irish nationalist MPs were left to probe the dangers of majoritarian rule in what was to be the six counties. If there were more of them there, they might have been able to foresee or tease out some of the things that happened uh, as a result of installing a majority rule parliament in an area that was carved out in order to create a permanent majority for one community over another. But they weren't there. And it's impossible to say what they might have done if they were. But it is important, I think, for us to reflect that abstentionism may be justifiable in some sense of principle, but it comes at a cost. Um, the electorate's support also for the no-compromise approach contained in the Sinn Féin Manifesto undoubtedly made life difficult for the treaty negotiators in 1921 and contributed to the civil war and to subsequent strife. If the Irish party's approach of vigorous agitation on rational lines had received more electoral support, although I know it would never have got majority in the conditions in which the election was fought, I think the treaty, treaty negotiations uh, might have been easier. And as we cope now with the prospect of the UK leaving the EU Customs Union, it's interesting to note that one of the big differences, as I said, between Home Rule and the Treaty was that the Treaty involved the Irish state leaving the Anglo-Irish Customs Union. Whereas in deference to Ulster, the 1911 to 1914 version of Home Rule would have had full free trade between the two islands. Now, both would have involved some form of partition, but just as we're talking now about the difference between a hard Brexit and a soft Brexit, one version might have involved soft partition, the other involved hard partition. And as the Taoiseach pointed out not so long ago, in fact, it was on this side of the border that the first customs controls were introduced in the 1920s by the Common Yale government and subsequently became more significant in the 1930s. Soft Brexit, hard Brexit, soft partition, hard partition. The mandate of the 1918 election was elevated, I think, 
to unsustainable heights in subsequent debates by honest and honourable people who felt they could not betray the very explicit no compromise mandate that they'd been given. And there are some similarities here to the over-interpretation, the overly literal interpretation of an electoral mandate uh, in the way in which the 19, 2016 mandate for Brexit in our neighbouring island is, was interpreted. Um, electoral mandates, however big, do not relieve the politicians who get them of the duty to be realistic about what can actually be achieved in negotiation with others afterwards. I think at this stage, uh, turning to the present day, we face a huge challenge in respect of what's going to happen about Brexit. I think the UK Parliament uh, needs to find a mechanism for working out what it really wants and what consensus it can build. I think the parliamentarians and former parliamentarians who are present will probably agree with me that the system whereby Parliament conventionally makes decisions, motions, amendments to motions, and amendments to amendments to motions, that procedure of taking these votes in ser seriatim can very easily end up that the final motion is also defeated. In other words, no decision is taken at all. That parliamentary procedure, I think, will not suffice for, in the UK Parliament to find an agreement. I think they need to look at other ways of finding a consensus, because a consensus probably does exist in some incohate form in Westminster, but they need a parliamentary mechanism to reach it. And my thinking is that they should look at the excellent work that's been done by select committees in the House of Commons. Uh, certainly in any research I do on Brexit, one of the first places I turn to are the reports of select committees of the House of Commons and the House of Lords in Britain. Excellent reports prepared by people who know what they're talking about. And I think what Theresa May needs to do now is to try to find a way of harnessing the commi committee system in Westminster, which is a rich and strong system, to work towards a consensus, not on the basis of motions that can be amended in the fashion that we, you know, the Count Corley is all too familiar with, but on the basis of you know, consensus building, multiple choice questions, a whole process of, of, of discussion, preferably, probably in private initially, to work out what might be a proposal that might command a majority in Parliament. Such an iterative process, there is time for that. There's plenty of time for it. It might involve people having to work on Stevens's day or Boxing Day, as they call it over there. Uh, but there is plenty of time to find a solution. And I've no doubt, from my knowledge as a member of the European Council, and Bertie will, I'm sure, endorse this, that the motive of the European Council is always to find a solution. They always want to find a solution. And none of us want to see Britain isolated from the rest of Europe. None of us want a no-deal scenario. But Britain needs to have that sort of concept of bipartisan leadership on this issue, and on this issue alone. Nobody's suggesting that parliamentary politics and the rivalry between the parties should be suspended. Although I think a lot of lessons could be learned in Britain from what has happened here in the last two years, but I won't go into that. That's another, another issue entirely. But I think the, we do need to find a solution to this. And I think contemplating the 1918 election is in Ireland and the efforts that we have made to find a solution to uh, governing a territory where allegiances are divided, uh, these are concepts that remain relevant and hopefully helpful in resolving the current dilemma over Brexit. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and thank you to Bertie as well. We are very honoured that, that we've had two former Tishi here and who have shared their thoughts on what is undoubtedly a seminal on a moment in uh, Irish history. 
and we're just going to take a small comfort break and change the top table and we'll be back to you in about two or three minutes I think uh, thank you <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.